And then you can think of a candle being lit by someone else moving quietly in the room, and you now see the gentle flame of the candle dancing in front of you with its warm glow pushing back against the darkness. And as the candle's light gradually pierces through the shadows, you notice something remarkable happening inside of you as well. That as the room is now being lit and is full of light and brightness, you see what's in front of you and you confidently make judgments about what to do or what not to do or where to go or where not to go. You are now confident in your walk and in your movement and you no longer worry about whether you will get hurt or whether you will get hit by unknown objects in the room. And you are now so confident in your judgment and decision that you are now a very, very different person. You're so much courageous and competent in taking the next steps compared to yourself in the darkness. And you realize that the light impacts not only your physical sight, but also your decision-making powers. You learn that light is not just for your body, but also for your soul because you realize that it's influencing your thoughts, it's influencing your will, and no doubt it's influencing your emotional movement and dynamics as well. Light from the sun is very important in everything that has life. Then how much more important will it be to have and to receive light from the God who is himself eternal light? Now, last week, uh, we had the opportunity to op uh, look at the opening part of the letter as we concentrated on the first four verses of chapter 1 in the letter of 1 John. We saw together that John packed a lot of truth and information in the first three verses that make up just one sentence. And if we uh, revisit the passage, well, this is what we find and hear from the Apostle John. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And what John wanted to do with this long sentence was to invite readers and hearers back to Christ's ministry here on earth. And right from the very beginning, John spoke to the central fact of the gospel that begins from his earthly ministry, that begins from his incarnation, and that begins from his fleshly presence here on this earth. Jesus came into history in the form of human flesh, and he dwelled with sinners, he dwelled among a real people. And that very word of life who exists and moves and has its being in all eternity was manifested in the human flesh. And all these Christians saw him, all these Christians heard him, and all these Christians touched him right uh, directly through their own senses. Jesus is real. And because he's the true God-man, uh, the apostles like John did not hesitate hesitate to proclaim and declare about him to the world, and they did so believing that the evangelical word that they shared with the people was the very means of uniting sinners to the eternal word, who is, of course, Jesus Christ. Through the evangelical word, we are united to the eternal word in the incarnate Jesus Christ. And that's what John wanted to communicate in these few verses that make up a lengthy sentence. And after that glorious introduction, John now gives us another interesting term to describe God and the nature of Jesus Christ. And this time he uses this profound word that is light. Light. 
uh, before John used terms like word and life to explain who Jesus was and who still is. And in expanding the list of basic Christian vocabulary for those early Christians, he is now using the term light to help them better understand who truly, who God truly is, and how they should live and have their being before this holy and pure God. Jesus, as our God, is word, is life, and is also light. And all these nouns were so crucial in teaching the early Christians about the holy and pure character of Jesus Christ. And these terms still govern the way we ought to speak about Jesus. And they are thoroughly biblical and they are thoroughly true that Jesus is not only eternal word or eternal life, but he's also our eternal light. And so let's go back to verse 5 again and begin from there for us today. And this is what John says after this glorious introduction in the first four verses. Verse 5, he says, This is the message which you have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And again, last week I mentioned that this letter was written sometime in the 90s in a place called Ephesus. And so that's the 90s in the first century, not the 1990s in the 20th century. And John wrote this letter to address a division or schism in the church that basically denied the incarnation of the Lord Jesus and his earthly presence. John's appeal to senses like hearing and seeing and touching emphasized the tangible nature of Christ's appearance, and he used words like word or life again in confirming the divine and the human natures of the single Christ. Jesus is both divine and human in his divine and single personhood, and because he is a true God and the true man, he alone can be our Savior and he alone can give us the eternal life that we all want and that we all need in our existence. And so if you come to verse 5 from that background, you'll notice that John is elaborating on the message that he had received and heard from the incarnate Lord Jesus. And not through this is not through the Holy Spirit later on in history, but directly through Jesus Christ when he was on earth, and that is what he meant by him. Here in verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him, incarnate Jesus, and this is the message that we declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And as you think about this verse, you might wonder, did Jesus really teach that he is light did Jesus really say that God is light, he is light, and is John really true in saying that this is the message that, I, that we heard and I heard from Jesus? Can we confirm the truthfulness of John's point here in verse 5? And the answer is, of course, a resounding yes, because we find that Jesus had already used the term light in describing himself and the holy God in his own teaching. So if you go to uh, the chapter 3 in the Gospel of John, we find Jesus saying this word from uh, verse 19. So Gospel of John chapter 3, Jesus said, The light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does come, uh, he, he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. And again in chapter 8 of the same gospel, we find this clear statement from Jesus he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 
And if you allow me to go one more step from here, one deeper from here, one level deeper, then I can also say that this metaphor was not a new revelation from Jesus, but rather a confirmation of the truths that we already find in the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, John would have been familiar with the theological traditions of his time as a Jewish disciple, and he would have known quite well the imagery of light that is also used in the Old Testament. So in addition to Psalm 119 that we read before, you can go to Psalm 27, Isaiah 60, for example, and even in those passages, you will easily read statements that say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. That is Psalm 27, verse 1. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And again in Isaiah 60, verse 19, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you. But the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. The Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God, your glory. And so we see that the term light here is not just a Greek philosophical term that's been borrowed from the Greek culture. Well, it has implications for that, but this was straight from the Old Testament, and that's the word that Jesus used to reveal his divine character and his eternal origin. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so as we look at this verse this morning, can I ask all of you, are there any aspects of your life where you've deliberately chosen to remain in the shadows, avoiding God's bright and illuminating truth of life. Have you been uh, acting on the belief that it's okay to uh, do sinful things when you're alone, well, nobody's watching you, nobody can find it out, so it's okay for me to engage in evil and sinful deeds because the consequences of doing these things are very low? And have you been sinning and doing wicked things when you are in private? And have you refused to come into the light because you enjoy the moments in the darkness? Or conversely, can you recall any moments where, by going closer to God, you found clarity, purpose, and also healing in your life? Can you pinpoint those moments and times when, by letting the word of life permeate into your life, you discovered a clearer sense of direction, a clearer sense of meaning, and a deeper experience of Christian joy and happiness that Jesus provides to those who abide in him. Are you walking away from the light, fearing that your inadequacies will be exposed? Or are you walking toward the light to see the nature of God better and to obey him and praise him better in your walk? with him. Now, a number of you know this already. I'll finish with this illustration. Um, one of my favorite sports is actually rugby. Uh, it's rugby union, if you want to know the specifics. And uh, having grown up in New Zealand, I came to love the sport from a young age. It's a national sport, if you know, uh, uh, in New Zealand. And every boy there wants to uh, play in the national, national rugby team. And the national team there is called the All Blacks, and they've been the most dominant team in the history of the sport for a very long time. And uh, it's a different story now because they went through ups and downs, but they won three World Cups, and they perform at a very high level that other nations and teams struggle to control. And one thing that the team shares as their core value and their principle is, according to them, Pressure is a privilege. Pressure is a privilege. And what that means is, if you want to grow and perform at a high level for the entirety of the game, that's 80 minutes, 
then you have to perform really well cons consistently throughout the game and especially under heavy pressure. Uh, just doing what's required of you on the field isn't going to make you a great athlete and you have to do what you have to do really, really well, but under heavy pressure. Uh, that's how a great player is made and a great player performs really well even when there is a high level of pressure. And whether the pressure comes from the crowd booing or from the referees and they get frustrated or even the criticism they get from media, if you want to get better at your uh, craft and if you want to grow as a great athlete, you just have to embrace pressure at every training, at every interview, and in every meeting and tackle that, learn to manage it whenever, it comes, whenever you experience it so that you can prepare for the moment when you're actually playing on the field and, 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 and put yourself under heavy pressure. And so they take, well, pressure is a privilege. If you learn to uh, face pressure outside the training, that's another opportunity for you to grow your mind and to grow your strength. And so if we come back to this, and if we think about our Christian life in light of that, but also against the background of verse 5, I think there is something that we can learn from the principle that pressure is a privilege because we need to go to the Holy God, His Word, His law, and His gospel. And it's okay for us to feel the pressure, as it were, if we, as we go nearer and closer to our Holy God. A growth in our Lord Jesus will not happen quickly if we neglect to see our inadequacies and sinfulness and shortcomings, and we can avoid the room of darkness and enter into the light if we have the willingness to face the pressure of God's holiness and the demands of the law. We need to go to God and His instruction even when God's word feels too burdensome and too heavy uh, to us. And we can uh, enjoy the comfort of the gospel, the freedom that the gospel gives to us only when uh, we face the burden of the pressure that God puts on us as our eternal light. You know, just like the uh, prophet Isaiah said in chapter 6 of the book, Woe to me, for I am undone. He said that after encountering these glorious uh, uh, heavenly uh, creatures uh, in his own vision. And just like that, it's normal for us to come nearer to God and feel utterly unworthy. We, we may feel like we're exposed. Our deepest desires and the secrets in our hearts, we feel like our, our desires and thoughts are exposed when we come nearer to the Word. And it is okay for us to feel that pressure because by it, we can pray for uh, God's strength and empowerment. And on the other, we can go to Jesus Christ and pray, thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross and delivering me from this burden of the law. And so feeling the pressure of God's Word and His holiness, I think can be a good thing for Christians. And if we can relate that to this verse here, in uh, First John, I just want to say, continue going toward God and His Word for your life, even when you feel the pressure of God's brightness. Even when your sins are exposed, keep going to God's Word and learn from Him. And don't stop facing that. Don't stop going into the light, but continue your walk in the light and walk away from darkness. Christ empowers you to live in the light as you pray to him, but this same Christ will also forgive you for the times when you fall into temptation. So let that be the first point for us today, that Christ empowers you to walk in the light. At the same time, he also forgives you for the times when you fell back in dark, into the darkness and into sin. And if we then move on to verses 6 and 7, we find John's call to an authentic and genuine fellowship. And this time he says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, 
we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us, cleanses us from all sin. And again, the metaphor of walking in the light is not just a new concept that is introduced by, by John or even Jesus. Uh, the expression walking echoes the Old Testament teaching that God's people should follow God's ways and obey His laws. And it is deeply embedded in the way J the Jews had to think about their lives before their holy and bright God. So Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, for example, exhorts Israel to obey God's commandment and in emphasizing the importance of faith, faithfulness and obedience, Moses delivers this message in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 6. He said, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. You shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. And so John's metaphor here resonates with an Old Testament teaching. And what this means for us is that our faith in Jesus should lead us to an authentic and honest obedience to God. And without that faithful and genuine obedience or walking in the light, we cannot truly experience the blessings of fellowship that God generously provides to us in Jesus Christ our Savior. We cannot enjoy the fullness of the Christian fellowship that Jesus provides to us if we do not walk in the light and obey God's commandments. So uh, imagine having friends uh, who repeatedly cancel plans, but they say that their friendship with you is so very strong. Uh, your friend doesn't have the time to meet you, to talk to you, or to help you but the friend always tells you on social media or WhatsApp or Facebook, you are so dear to me. You are so special to me. I don't, I don't trust anyone else but you, and you are so special in my life that I'm dedic dedicating this time to, uh, to write something like this, uh, this message to you. You are so special. You are so precious, but I just don't want to meet you. Uh, for some reason, I don't want to see you in person, but you are so special to me. And so if you, if you think about a scenario like that, you will easily notice that there's a big gap between the words spoken and the actions taken. And you will know that that kind of confession or expression is meaningless um, if it's not backed up by the actions that show that intimate heart. You're saying one thing with your mouth, but you're doing completely opposite things with your actions. And that inconsistent life is what we Christians should avoid. John is teaching us we should avoid that if we really want to honor Jesus through our word and through our deeds. And so if we say that we have fellowship with Jesus and with his people here at South Yarra, but we continue to walk in the darkness, uh, then we're effectively lying and, and are not practicing the truth that we as a church treasure as the word of Christ. So as you read these verses, you can ask yourself once again, are my actions consistent with my Christian faith? And if I do confess that I love God and love Jesus Christ, do I carve out certain time during the week for prayer, for reading the Bible, for the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? Am I truly living out Christ's teachings in my family, in my private life, and also in my workplace and in times of weakness? And when there is pressure or temptation, do I lean on the grace that is provided through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, have I really understood the truth of Jesus Christ? And if I have really understood that, then am I practicing what I understand to be of eternal importance? And so please reflect on yourself today by using or by reading this uh, verse here. And again, keep obeying God's truth, uh, even if you feel the pressure of God's demand 
and continue walking in the light, believing that the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. And that's a pastoral message that the Apostle John wants to give you today, that you are forgiven in Jesus, and with this forgiveness, continue going into the light and abide in Christ's holy word. And lastly, we go through verses 8 through 10, and in this rather last portion, John addresses the importance of forgiveness and says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, that we make Christ a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, in our contemporary world, uh, we often hear about the importance of vulnerability. Uh, vulnerability, uh, it means the ability to open up and share our weaknesses and shortcomings and fears and mistakes with others. It has become one of the uh, key slogans that are used in leadership lessons and also community formation uh, principles. And many people today like to say, well, vulnerabil vulnerability is a new strength. Vulnerability is not a weakness, but it is a new strength because it is a mark of a strong person to be accepting of one's mistakes and without a critical understanding of self and the willingness to admit that before others. Well, effective leadership will be difficult to produce and those who pretend to be perfect will not go very far in terms of earning people's trust and confidence as leaders or more, uh, more as human beings, uh, more in general. And, and to a certain degree, I think that's a valuable principle for us to reflect on and practice as well. Um, and it's important for us to create an environment in the church where we can be uh, vulnerable with others. Um, and it'll be great for us to have a community here where we can share honest confession of our struggles and sins and mistakes and expect others to accept us and hear our struggles in godly and respectful manners uh, before we criticize others and blame them for their wrongdoings. I think it would be good for us to first acknowledge our own mistakes and we, as we um, acknowledge who we really are and how we are actually living. We are all sinners. Uh, then I think we can uh, form a community where we can accept that nobody is perfect and nobody, is, um, nobody has everything figured out in terms of morality, values, relationships, including all these work and finance related matters. So, you might imagine something like this, that you're driving a car and you made a wrong turn. You're lost in your journey and you don't know where to go and what to do as you're making sense of what you've just done. But instead of just, uh, instead of admitting your mistake and asking for directions, you just keep driving, hoping to find a way in random instances and encounters. You might even tell your passengers that you know exactly where you're going despite being lost, but everyone in the car is sensing that you are indeed very lost. Uh, we are lost is the feeling that's shared clearly in the car but you ignore that and dismiss that, and you continue to drift away from your destination, and you finish the journey through so much unnecessary difficulty, trial, and also tension. And as a result of that, you're now known as a person who leads others with your vices of negligence and stubbornness, and that's the name that you've created for yourself among your peers, a person who's not honest and realistic, but who is insecure, who is stubborn, and who is also dismissive. And so when we, when we refuse to confess our sins and pretend to be great and perfect, that we are acting like the driver refusing to acknowledge the wrongs and mistakes made in our pilgr pilgrimage. 
We deceive ourselves and move, move away from the way of truth if we say we have no sin. And just like asking for directions can guide us quickly back on track, confessing our sins before others can align us with God's will quickly and correctly if it's done in honest and careful ways. Let's remember that we are all sinners saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to highlight and display through our deeds, that Christ did not just come to increase communities of hypocrites, but he came to forgive sinners, including those around you and including yourself. And so as we end, let me simply exhort you, walk in the light as God is in the light. Walk in the light and make efforts to align your actions with God's holy and bright character. See God's truth through prayer and scripture and strive to live in a way that reflects Jesus' faithful and just character. Christ has come to forgive you and redeem you through his death and resurrection. And so you have nothing to worry about. You can just go to God in repentance and faith. And embrace the pressure, as it were, that Christ gives you as eternal light. Continue to walk in God's instruction and choose the right path for you. And avoid the way of the wicked at, at all cost. At all cost for the glory of Jesus and for the salvation of your soul. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you once again for this morning. We thank you for gathering us in this place of worship and uh, enabling us to sing together, pray together, and sing your word together. And Father, as we saw from the passage in 1 John, we pray that you would convict us of your brightness a bit more strongly. Uh, Father, you are not just our helper or assistant, but you are our leader. You are our light, our lamp. And so help us go to you and find the direction of our lives. And when, even when we discover our sinfulness, shortcomings, inadequacies, and uh, mistakes, that is in light of your word, help us continue to go to you in your word and give you thanks for the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves us from the a burden of the law and that saves us from death, judgment, and punishment. And in doing so, help us also pray for the strength that comes from you. And so please strengthen us in our walk with you and help us uh, remain in your word so that we can live in the light and not in the darkness and complete our journey in our pilgrimage as one who loves Jesus and as one who enters the glorious kingdom that is our heavenly Jerusalem. So Father, we thank you and we give this prayer in Jesus' wonderful name, amen.